For the first time in a long time, I was sound asleep. No dreams or nightmares, just rest. And boy, did I need it. It had been a week since New Year's Eve when I fainted at the stroke of midnight. That's when the nightmares started. Every goddamn night, twisted visions of being buried alive and dying a slow, claustrophobic death. It all came to a head two days ago when I woke up with the flu and started hallucinating. Only now I know I wasn't sick. Now I know that death had gripped my soul. I came home from work that Friday feeling awful. Joan had left for the weekend and our apartment seemed small and desolate. Sick and lonely, I crumpled on the couch and watched some garbage movies on Netflix until I began to nod off. Then I picked myself up and stumbled off to bed. The night passed quietly. Nothing out of the ordinary, unless you count the inevitable nightmare which jolted me wide awake Saturday morning. What a day that was. I felt old and arthritic and had to laugh when Isaac texted that he wanted to go out for a beer. No way in hell was I leaving my place unless it was on fire. There weren't any hallucinations, thank God, but still, I had this strange feeling, like something was watching my every move. Not pleasant. Anyway, my Saturday consisted of more Netflix, a tentative message exchange with Joan, and scrounging around in the kitchen. Joan said she was feeling better, and though neither of us mentioned it, I think we both knew it was because she'd gotten away from me. I tried my best not to think about that, or what it might mean for our relationship, but it was like trying to ignore a mosquito on the back of my neck, next to impossible. Sunday brought more of the same, but this time, the nightmare had been different. This time I dreamt that I was watching my own funeral. I saw the casket lying in the open grave, presumably with my embalmed and nicely dressed corpse inside. I saw my Joni on her knees in a black dress, clutching handfuls of fresh, damp earth as she wept. I saw my mother, also in black, veiled and morose. Isaac, Franklin, and Bill were all there, too. My quad mates looked solemn, and it was they who began to shovel in the dirt. Even though I was just a nameless, faceless observer, I've never felt so cold, so empty inside while dreaming, especially once the preacher appeared. Whoever he was, this guy was older and tall, gaunt and very pale. He had short black hair, and as he began to recite the Lord's Prayer, I felt myself, my actual physical sleeping self, not my dream self, begin to tremble. His voice was like thunder, deep and loud and everywhere. It echoed throughout the graveyard, and his stern, hollow eyes bored right into me. Again, the actual, physical me. For thine is the kingdom, the power and glory, forever and ever. And I woke up just before the creepy son of a bitch said amen. I still felt like crap, and now I had the added bonus of acute paranoia. I was jumping at shadows all day. Every little noise practically gave me a heart attack. And as the day faded into night, I began to feel very afraid. I can't really explain why, either. I just felt like something horrible was going to happen. And it did, of course, but not till much later. I hadn't heard from Joan all day, and I was literally about to call and beg to let me stay at her parents' house that night, but I knew how crazy and pathetic I'd sound. So I sucked it up, took a long, hot shower, swallowed a shot and a half of NyQuil, and dragged my ass to bed. I also left my reading light on. All of which brings me back to where I started, lying in bed, dreamless, finally at peace. That's when it happened, the whole goddamn thing. First the voice, a disembodied whisper inside my head but outside of my sleep. Blaine. Then something grabbed and shook me, jarring me awake, and whatever it was, it succeeded quite well. Lane. I jerked, gasped, and sprang out of bed like an idiot. Couldn't see a damn thing. The light had gone out and thick walls of darkness closed in around me. Lane. I screamed. The blanket slid off the mattress, twisting around my legs, and I fell to my knees. Panic surged in my veins and my heart lurched into overdrive. Fuck, I growled. Frantic, I leapt to my feet and, half-crouched, groped my way to the light switch. My hand shook as if gripped by delirium tremens. I swung my head around, trying to look everywhere at once, reeling from the fear that someone had broken into my apartment. Finally, 
My bleary eyes began to adjust and familiar shapes emerged from the shadows. I saw the large dresser against the far wall, the outline of the shaded window and Joan's closet on the other side of the bed. The door to the hallway stood out in the murkiness and I stumbled toward it, hands in front of me like a blind man. Looking over my shoulder, I ran my fingers along the wall, trying to find the light switch. The grainy drywall seemed to go on forever, but I didn't dare turn my head. Whoever was in there had to be right behind me. I didn't see anyone or anything, but that didn't matter. The fucker could have been hiding under the bed for all I knew. My mind was racing. Was it a robber? Some sick Dahmer-like serial killer? Was I gonna die? And where was the fucking light switch? Well, it felt like forever, which means it was probably about two seconds, but I found the damn switch and flicked it on. The harsh overhead light made me wince and groan, and through squinted eyes I scanned the room for the supposed invasor. But other than the blankets on the floor, nothing looked out of place. All right, I said, struggling to calm down. Whoever you are, come on out. No response. The bedroom fell silent. No hint of movement anywhere. The bed, I thought. That's where he is. He must have slid beneath it. Shit. I guess nobody's here after all. Hoping to God that I sounded convincing, I walked around the bed and over to Joan's closet. My heart was still thumping, but at least I could see. I reached for the closet door, hesitated, wondering if the intruder had actually slipped in there. Then, mustering all of my courage, I pulled it open. I was scared, but still fairly sure that no one could have gotten in there without making a ton of noise. And from the looks of it, no one had. All I saw was a familiar row of dresses, skirts, blouses, and pants, all crammed together. A long wire rack filled with shoes lined the bottom. All of Joan's things, of course, and I had no use for any of that. With another glance over my shoulder, I slid my arm into the depths of the closet, reaching for the far corner. After a few seconds of groping, I found what I needed. My father's old walking stick. Oh yeah. This relic was the last thing my father gave me before he died. Touching it conjured up uh, bittersweet memories of slow and sightful walks around the dull Dibert district where he lived. Once he'd become too decrepit to walk even with the aid of the stick, he'd given it to me, saying, Here, son, something to remember me by. Maybe you'll find a use for it someday. And I, the ever-grateful son, had kept it tucked away for the last three years. Of course, Pop had meant that maybe one day I'd need the stick to get around myself, but now I had another, more violent use for it. Namely, to crack the skull of the dumb crackhead moron who'd broken into my place. Thanks, Pop. I began to shiver as I held the long, heavy stick in my hand, getting a feel for its weight. A thick brass knob crowned the top, which, meant, which I meant to bludgeon the intruder with. It would be both bloody and bloody well effective. Better fix those blankets, I muttered, trying to sound nonchalant. In nothing but my underwear, I walked toward the bed. My whole body trembled from nerves and fear. If I did this right, I'd have something to brag about at the quad later on. If I screwed up, I was sure to get my ass kicked. And call me pathetic, but I was imagining that the guy under the bed was bigger, stronger, and faster than me. I was sure that he was a vicious, petty criminal who'd survived dozens of street brawls. While me, on the other hand, hadn't been in a fight since high school. Let's just say I wasn't all that comfortable with conflict. And now, here I am, I thought, holding this walking stick like I'm Steven fucking Seagal. What if this guy has a knife or a gun? Christ, I should have listened to Isaac and Franklin. Still trembling, I reached the bed, closed my eyes, tightened my grip, took a deep breath. Steady now, I told myself. Go easy. In my brief journey across the room, I developed what I thought was a sound plan. Simple, direct, and, I sincerely hoped, as safe as it could be. I'd just drop down and have a look under the bed. If I saw someone, I'd just stand back up and wait for him to slither out. Isaac the smug bastard would have been proud. So, eyes open, teeth grit, I fell to my knees and hunched over to meet the psycho face to face. Oh, fuck, I groaned, slightly disappointed and greatly embarrassed. But I couldn't deny what I saw, or rather, what I didn't see. Absolutely nothing. No one under the bed. Like an idiot, I stared at the empty space for a while, shaking my head in disbelief. No, oh, I gibbered. No, no, no. There was someone in here, goddammit. I felt him. I felt his hand. I heard what sounded like an electric sizzle. Zzz. 
and jerked back to my knees. The overhead light blinked once, twice, then faded, allowing darkness to again swallow the room. I stood, still holding Pop's walking stick, and looked at the familiar shapes lurking in the shadows. Great, I said, just great. With a heavy sigh, I laid the walking stick on Joan's side of the bed and went around the bed to gather up the blankets. After two steps, I stopped. A sharp cramp struck below my navel, almost like getting punched. My bladder, telling me that I had to piss like a racehorse, and if I didn't go soon, I'd pee all over the place. Damn it, I thought, doing a weary about face and shuffling into the hall, unaware that I'd been summoned, unaware of my grim destiny hiding beyond the bathroom door.